Bismillah, Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. You're listening to Immunology Lesson on Innate and Adaptive Immunities, and this episode is part two of the topic. I want to start with um, phagocytosis again to kind of tether what I taught you in the previous episode. Um, phagocytosis is extremely common in the innate immune response. It is usually conducted by um, antigen-presenting cells, such as macrophages or dendritic cells. You have the attachment of microorganisms, and then you have the ingestion, and then you have the killing through the formation of phagolysosome, and then you have the degradation of the target microbes. I want to bring your attention to this part where you have fragments of the pathogen being displayed as antigens. So this is the uh, this is a key event that transitions the innate into the adaptive immunity. So once you have a successful display of antigens by antigen presenting cells, um, that leads to the activation of T cells or B cells. Um, activation of T cells generally leads to the cell mediated response, while the activation of the B cells leads to the antibody mediated response. Now, um, before we move further, we need to ask ourselves, what happens when our T cells or B cells detect antigens that belong to our own body? Um, so in other words, what happens when our adaptive immune cells encounter self antigens? So I, I, I want you to really appreciate this problem because it is at the heart of many autoimmune diseases. So the problem is if our immune cells get activated after detecting antigens, what happens when they detect self antigens. So it means our immune system will attack the cells of our own body. Our soldiers attack our own citizens. So the solution to that problem is the concept of clonal deletion. So in the context of immunology, a clone is a group of T or B cells that has one specific shape of receptors. So clonal deletion is the elimination of those clones that can recognize self antigens. So here's how it works. Our um, pluripotent cells can generate so many types of clones, so thousands upon thousands of them. So say you have clone X, clone Y, and clone Z. So during the lymphocyte development, all of them are exposed to self antigens, so antigens that belong to cells in our own body. Now, during this exposure, if clone X cannot bind to self-antigen because the shape doesn't match, clone X will survive. And then clone Y also can't bind, so clone Y will also survive the clonal deletion. But then, now and then, you have clones like clone Z, which happens to have receptors that match self-antigens. So when that binding happens, the whole members of clone Z will be deleted. So none of them will leave the primary lymphoid organs. So this process of clonal deletion is part of the early maturation of lymphocytes in the primary lymphoid organs, which is the thymus for the T cells and bone marrow for B cells. So this clonal deletion is extremely vital for immunotolerance. So it means our mature immune cells will tolerate our own antigens and will not attack our own cells. So um, when you hear about any autoimmune diseases, so it could mean that something is wrong with that immunotolerance and clonal deletion. So if everything goes well, after passing through the clonal deletion process, and once the T cells encounter antigens presented by antigen presenting cells, the T cells get activated. So being activated here means uh, the cells differentiate into various forms of T cell types. And, and all of these happens in the secondary lymphoid organs. And one key observation when this is happening is clonal expansion, which is when you have the clones that bind to a pathogen, so those clones proliferate or, or multiply in numbers. Now, I want you to pay attention to the locations of this activation. Antigen-presenting cells, such as dendritic cells, they capture the pathogen at the site of infection. So they do their um, phagocytosis there. 
and then they will carry that antigen from the site of infection to the lymph nodes. Now, in the lymph nodes, the dendritic cells will present the antigen to naive T cells. This is happening in the lymph node, yeah, not the site of infection. If the presentation is successful, the naive T cells will be activated to become effector T cells. So effector T cells are uh, what we call them after they get activated and ready to affect immune response. So before activation, we call them naive T cells. After activation, we call them effector T cells. So after this activation, some effector T cells will remain in the lymph nodes um, to help out with the activation of B cells, which we'll talk more about later, maybe in the next episode. And some other T cells will move from the lymph nodes to the site of infection to fight off the pathogens there. So remember that, yeah? The activation of T cells doesn't occur in just one location. It happens in at least two locations, the site of infection and the secondary lymphoid organs like lymph nodes. So the activation of T cells leads to the differentiation of those cells. What that means is the cells change into one of at least four types of cells, T helper cells, cytotoxic T cells, regulatory T cells, and memory T cells. So think of these four types of cells as playing different roles on the battlefield. The T helper cells, for example, are uh, the attack coordinators that send signals to attack. Cytotoxic T cells are the combat vessels that physically attack the enemy cells. Regulatory T cells are responsible to tell everyone to stand down once the enemy is defeated. And memory T cells, they remember what the pathogens look like for um, future reference. Now, it is important for you to familiarize yourself with the abbreviations of these cells' names because that will help you avoid confusion when you study the textbook or online references after listening to this episode. So, for example, we immunologists often abbreviate T helper cells to TH, cytotoxic T cells to TC, regulatory T cells to TREG, and memory T cells to TM. And also, be aware that these are not the only way to abbreviate the names of the cells. For example, cytotoxic T cells can also be abbreviated to CTL, which is short for cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So in the beginning, you might feel confused here and there, but don't be too hard on yourself. The, the more you read, the more you study, your brain will just get better at um, recognizing the shorthands. Now, T helper cells are not just one type you have different subtypes of them. There are more than three, but at this stage, I want you to focus your reading on Th1, Th2, and Th17. So Th1 typically releases interferon gamma and interleukin-2 and is important in stimulating the cytotoxic T cells and macrophages. Th2 cells often release IL-4 and IL-13 and stimulate B cells and eosinophils. Um, Th17 cells release interleukin 17 and 21 and involve in the stimulation of neutrophils as well as inflammatory regulation. So um, you will learn that each subtype stimulates activities of different cells and is associated with different types of cytokines. For instance, Th1 cells are crucial in cell-mediated responses. So when you have Th1 pathway activated, then the Th cell will release cytokines like interleukin-2 and gamma interferon and bind to cells like macrophages or cytotoxic T cells. Now, if the antigen presentation triggers the Th2 pathway, the T helper cells will release different sort of um, interleukins and bind to different cells, such as B cells, and, and that will lead to antibody-mediated responses. Now, I don't want you to think that this is clear-cut, right? It's either one or the other. So things are actually messier than a simple Th1 versus Th2. So often, the balance between the two can determine the outcomes of infection. Um, I'll leave a link on the reference page if you are interested to read more about them. Uh, I'll find something for you. For cytotoxic T cells, they usually conduct a direct cellular attack. 
um, one way to think about our adaptive immunity is that it has two different ways of attacking. One is an attack using cells, and two is an attack using antibodies. So when we attack using cells, we usually involve cytotoxic T cells. The primary targets for such an attack include infected host cells or cancerous host cells. And uh, the main payload for their weapon system includes granzymes and perforins. So the cytotoxic T cells will first learn how the antigen of the enemy look like. Then, um, then after activation, cytotoxic T cells will approach the uh, infected cells and come very close to it. So it's hand-to-hand -hand combat. So once they get close enough to the enemy, they will fire their weapons containing those granzymes and perforins. So those granzymes and perforins will either perforate or breach the surface of the enemy vessels, enemy cells, or, or cause the enemy to initiate um, a kind of a suicide protocol or a self-destructive process called apoptosis. So that will kill the target cell. The job of regulatory T cells is to um, command the other immune cells to stand down their weapons once they're not needed anymore. So this is so vital to prevent excessive reactions, to maintain just enough level of the immune response. Otherwise, you'll get um, collateral damages where our immune system starts destroying our own cells. And surface markers for Treg are CD4 and FOXP3. So that's how you identify them in your samples. And um, arguably the most characteristic type of adaptive immune cells, which makes our adaptive immunity so amazing, is the memory T cells. So this is the group of our T cells that remember every single antigen that we are exposed to every time when we get an infection. And they will use that memory to mount a much more effective response when we encounter the same pathogen again. And we have at least four types of memory T cells. Central memory T cells, usually um, home or return primarily to lymph nodes. Effector memory T cells, on the other hand, often um, concentrate in mucosal tissues. Tissue resident memory T cells can be found in um, non-lymphoid tissues, but uh, do not circulate in the blood. So you can't find them in the blood, which is often placed in contrast to peripheral memory T cells, which prefer to move around between the non-lymphoid tissues and the blood circulation. I touched on this in the earlier episodes that um, activation of the cell requires at least two signals. The first signal is the antigen, and the second signal is the co-stimulation. There are many types of co-stimulation, but for this course, I want you to just study the uh, B7 CD28 co-stimulation uh, as an illustrative example. So on the surface of the T cell, you have a receptor called CD28. The ligand for CD28 is called B7. B7 has two homologous proteins called CD80 and CD86. So they are on your antigen presenting cells. So the main idea here is when CD28 binds to B7 molecules, you get the activation of T cell. And this binding between CD28 and B7 is not optional. For example, if you have naive T cell that binds perfectly with the antigen presented by antigen presenting cells, but if you don't have the co-simulatory binding between CD28 and B7, you won't get the activation of the naive T cell and you won't get an immune response. So another way of putting this is your T cell will tolerate the presence of antigen and the pathogen associated with it. But if you have a good binding between the antigen and receptor on T cells, and then you have the binding between CD28 and B7, then you will have a full activation of the naive T cells. So they will start producing interleukins and they will start um, proliferate and differentiate into um, relevant effector T cells. And you have the activation of your adaptive immune response. So our understanding of this co-stimulation principle has a real life impact. So for example, we can use this principle to treat patients who suffer um, organ transplantation rejection or certain forms of arthritis. Uh, 
So what happens with these patients is that their immune system starts attacking um, organs or cells that we don't want it to attack. So one way to dampen that immune response is by using CTLA-4IG, which is a fusion protein where we stick together um, human immunoglobulin with a receptor molecule called CTLA-4. And when you give this to patients, the B7 receptor on the antigen-presenting cells will prefer to bind to the CTLA-4 rather than CD28 on your naive T cells. The reason for that is that B7 has a higher affinity to CTLA-4 compared to CD28. So I talked about affinity previously, so check out earlier episodes where I talked about affinity if you forget what that means. In any case, when this treatment is successful, then B7 won't bind to CD28 and the T cells won't activate and your adaptive immunity will stop attacking the transplanted organ or um, your joint cells in the case of arthritis. And this immunotherapy is called co-stimulatory blockade. All right, I'll stop here for now. I'll talk to you in the next episode. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.